Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Real Talk 447, 30 plus two. I know it's been a while, we've been on summer vacation, but uh, I promise you today's show you're gonna really enjoy. But before we get to that, we also have to thank our sponsors, RockyMountainATVMC.com, Slick Products, ODI Grips and Handlebars, and of course, Fox Racing. He said, if you can't win, wreck someone who can. Exactly. And that was, I, but I knew exactly. I wasn't winning that. Why do people not get out of the fast lane? Right. Every time I see that picture of you riding around with that big ass fro you're wearing, it, I still get pissed. It was that night I said, preparate, but I didn't say what I wasn't supposed to say, and that's A1. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Real Talk 447, 30 plus 2. I'm Jeff Emig, Ricky Carmichael. Our special guest today is the 450 AMA Pro Motocross Champion, Zach Osborne. We're going on the clock for 30 minutes plus 2 starting now. Zach Osborne, the new champ. Welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you, dude. I'm doing good. I'm just on a little family vacation uh, this week at the beach in Florida. And, um, yeah, thank you guys for having me on. Sweet. So, um, just spending a little time, taking a little break. Uh, I can imagine, you know, it's only been, what, a week and a half or so, but uh, you've had a whirlwind summer. Um, but the media obligations uh, in the last week or so have to be um, pretty pretty heavy for you. Surprisingly, I haven't had that many. Um, I did Pulp Show on the Monday night after and the, P, uh, the press conference uh, the night of. And, yeah, maybe one or two other little things, but that's it. It hasn't been uh, – hasn't been that bad. I've been around for a hot minute, so I think people are like sick of asking the same question. <laughs> well, they certainly want to listen to the new chant. That was uh, that was that was so awesome. I mean, I I felt like when you won when you won the last Supercross race at Salt Lake, I'm like, oh man, this is just going to give you some serious fire uh, mentally. And uh, you you finished strong last season in the outdoors as well. And and uh, I think I feel like you and I are similar. Uh, and when it comes to outdoor, I think just our riding styles, our mentality and, and, and what makes us fire and our work ethic, our body build and, and, and what we're made up of that just really fits in our wheelhouse and things are a little bit easier. But uh, man, you, you had a, it was so fun to watch uh, to watch you and and uh, I got some fun questions and different stuff that I I certainly want to hear from you. Um, uh, how long is it that uh, that you will be able to uh, take off of like not riding at all? So I'm not riding again until um, November the 9th so it's going to be basically a whole month of no riding um, and then we have a week of riding then our photo shoot so we're going to get that out of the way right off the bat. Um, before the training camp starts and then um, we have just an, a solid eight week camp you know it's it's been a pretty quick turnaround but also I think it's going to be okay because we can kind of ramp into it a little slower this off season, and um, and just kind of take it a little bit more mellow because the there hasn't been such a big lull and the the off season's not so so long from the last outdoor to the first supercross so it, it actually may you know in, in one way make it a little bit easier going forward uh, into next season. Now, why, why the gap in the riding? Are you, are you like self-imposed? You just taking a break? What's what, just taking a break. I've actually had, um, I was thinking about it the other day. I started with the 450 on October the 8th, uh, October the 1st, 2018. So I've been riding and training consistently since that date, October 1st, 2018. So over two years now, I had like uh, two weeks off the bike after designations last year. And then I had, um, a couple of injuries that were you know sort of six weeks so uh but but injury downtime is not like you know real downtime it, you're chasing something you're chasing rehab you're trying to get back on the bike so it's it's maybe even more stressful than actually doing the job to be honest um so you're married Brittany, and then yep. you guys have two children you have emory who's how old now six she just turned six six and bodie who's uh well he'd be two, two. just a yep. little too um i gotta think that 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 sort of dedication to your job like that and knowing what it what it requires you know puts a lot of weight on Brittany's shoulders when you have two children also yeah for sure but i mean we share the workload in, in both areas um you know her for me and me for her 
Um, she homeschools both kids. Obviously, Bodie's still a bit young for actual schooling at the moment, but she homeschools Emery full time. Um, yeah, I mean, she's pretty pretty all star to be honest with you. So, what what is your domestic um, duty that you do that uh, you know people might not might not think that that's your thing? Like, what's your thing? Like, I love doing laundry. That's my deal. I'm I am the. I hate doing laundry. I like doing dishes because it's pretty gratifying to do dishes. You can just like look back when you're done and you're like, oh, wow, you know, I, I, I made some change here. But laundry at our house is just like this never ending mountain of, of laundry. Um, mostly mine, if I'm honest, because I wear like four sets of clothes a day because I get up, train, go to the gym, you know, go riding. That's another set of clothes and then something before bed. So it's, it's at least three sets a day. And uh, I contribute massively to the, to the pile. But dishes is probably my thing. What about like uh, meals? Like who whips up the meals, whether it's for the kiddos or for you guys, you and Brittany at, at, uh, at dinner time, breakfast, lunch, whatever. Well, you're gone most of the time at lunch uh, out training and riding, but what, like, do you, do you pitch in on the meals also? Uh, I do all the grilling or smoking or whatever we do as far as that goes. Uh, outdoor cooking, I do all that. She does pretty much all the inside cooking. I have a couple dishes um that I learned really well and when I was in England by myself like uh stir fry four nights a week you know so I got pretty good at that um but most of the cooking I would say 90 percent was her um when did you guys um uh, get together when you were in England no so we met when we were 12 at um Ponca City we were together for a long time um we had one year where it was a little a little bit rough and then um we got back together when we were 16 and then we've been together since. So, um, yeah, almost 15 years now. It's such an incredible story, you know, when you see you guys and, and, and this kind of leads me into, to my first question, but where, where you guys have come from. And I mean, you had a really good amateur career, high expectations coming out of the pro uh, amateurs going into the pros. And, uh, it was a rough go for you. It seemed like, you know, especially at the beginning, just thing for, for whatever, whatever was happening. And, and, and I know, you know, it's a big jump from the amateurs to pros. However, uh, she, she's been there all, the whole time with you. And I feel like that is just, it's, it's probably been, I'd like to know if it's been comforting for you at times that you guys are a team of two together. Yeah. Through thick and thin and, uh, I mean, has she really been like just it for you and your right hand all the time? I mean, it's it's so cool from the outside looking in that she's there. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, she's the one constant throughout everything that, that I've gone, done, been through, whatever you want to say. Um, she's the one constant. So, you know, no matter what, no matter the result, no matter, you know, what happens during the day, I can come home and she's going to be there for me. And that's you know, that's like nothing else. I, I think I wish, you know, I, we talk about it all the time that we wish people could experience marriage in the way that we do. You know, it's, it's pretty, pretty blissful. I mean, we both work at it really hard and, and it's what we say is, you know, most people know it as a give and take, but we say it's a give and give. You just give and the other person gives and you just keep on giving, you know, you're, you're not trying to take. I was actually walking through the airport the other day. Um, in Atlanta and, and some people behind me were having a conversation about marriage. And, and it struck me because the lady uh, who was talking to the guy, I don't know if they were, I don't think they were married, but I, I don't really know the deal. I didn't even look back, but I heard the lady say like, you could either be um, t cut in half by marriage or, or doubled by marriage. You know, the person can cut you in half and take half of you, or the person can, you know, basically double you. And, and I feel like that that's kind of, it, it, fit, it hit me because it kind of fits us. You know, we, we kind of multiply each other and, and feed off of each other. And it's just um, something that I'm really proud of and, and something that I cherish in my life. Keep, keep in mind, you're on Real Talk with two divorced guys. <laughs> it, it happens. You made it a lot further than we did. <laughs> no, but that's uh, – no, I mean, it's, it's rare. And I, um, I reflect on this sometimes, um, you know, looking back on my own career and how it was so up and down. And I used to say, man, I, I, I just don't know how these guys could, could have a professional supercross motocross career – uh, be married, have children, and and take the type of risk and 
take the time and dedication and everything that goes along with it. Um, and like some of my friends, like Buddy Antonez, Nathan Ramsey, some of these guys, um, you know, had children while they were still racing. And that was something that I didn't, I didn't do. Um, and, I, and I used to think of it as like, wow, what a distraction that would be because you got dishes to do, you got laundry, the baby has diabetes, blah, 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 blah. Um, but it seems like now that I'm, I'm, I'm older and I understand it more. It seems like, it's especially for somebody like yourself, the ups and downs that you've had, that it has to be grounding and, and focus. I mean, if I think about the distractions that, you know, relationships can have for different people, um, you know, it, 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 it can really take away from your overall goal and having Brittany there for you as your foundation kind of takes that distraction away and, and, you know, adds so much to it. So I think that that's really cool. Yeah. I, um, I'm really analytical. I'm really a numbers guy. I think that there's kind of always truth in the numbers, you know, um, I'm really anal about my training and, and kind of OCD about my routine and, um, actually my, my household responsibilities and, and the kids and Brittany kind of take my mind off of that sometimes because I, I kind of, uh, tend to, not obsessed, but maybe a little bit, you know, I want everything. I want to control every single little aspect of, of what's going on. And, um, sometimes that, that those responsibilities can kind of take me out of that, that loop that I get in of thinking and thinking and thinking and, and just kind of bring me back to how simple it really is, you know, like just in general life is, is pretty simple as, or as simple as, as you make it. So I think that that's one huge part of, of the kids for me is just, you know, seeing them go in the backyard and play with a box or whatever, you know, whatever it is that, that it's, it's just so simple and it doesn't really take that much for any of us to be happy. We, we kind of chase this hamster wheel all the time. And, and I think a lot of people have learned during this kind of COVID deal, you know, that what we're really longing for is more time with the people we love. And, and that's one thing that I'm really blessed with is a lot of time to, to be at home and to be with my kids and be with my wife and just kind of enjoy the the little things in life. And that's kind of what we try to do is just uh, um, keep it simple. Yeah. Um, so you've, you've been through it all and you've basically resurrect, re resurrected yourself and built a new career. I believe uh, you're, you're a premier class winner and now champion um, for 50 motocross can you take us through the journey <clears throat> and when you signed with Rockstar Husqvarna team, how, how, did that, how, how did that come about where you were at in your career at the time? Like what were those conversations like and how, how did it come about? Well, let me, let me, so, Zach, let me back, back up. So top amateur, high expectations, wrote for KTM, one year of pro here and then didn't happen, went to England, uh, rode some GPs, rode British Championship, things like that. Wanted to come back home, and then, yeah. So, and like, that was, well, like t talk us through that. How did you get this opportunity? I mean, were you working for yourself? Were you out there like handing out business cards? Talk us through that. Well, I actually had an opportunity at the end of 2011 to come back and ride for uh, Rockstar Suzuki at the time. So the same same team, same people. Um, and I had, I was going to leave my last year of GPs, um, because I was turning 23 for 2012 would, would have been my last year of GPs and MX2. I was getting married in 2012. So I was kind of looking to come home, um, instead of starting my, you know, my married life in, in a foreign country. Um, I was also kind of content to do so and, and race MX1 or just stay there or whatever, you know, I had. I'd been there for five years and I had kind of settled down to, to an extent. So um, I had this opportunity with Rockstar Husky. I told my boss about it. I'm like, look, this is a pretty good job, like good money. All, you know, I can, I can really, I think I can do good on this team. And he was like, look, you, you know, it's late in the season. You can't leave us like this. Like we don't have anyone for next year. You have a really good chance to be, you know, in a good position to maybe win a title, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, well, if you're not going to let me do this, will you, will you take our bike? Because I knew our bike was fast and I knew 
you know, we could get something good enough suspension wise to do decent. Um, we take our bike and let me do four supercrosses in the beginning of January. So he agreed. Um, we did those four supercrosses out of the back of my van and with some support from Rock River Yamaha. And I managed to get on the podium twice. And that, that kind of opened the floodgates for coming back. Um, I had an offer from pretty much everyone in the pits. Um, Mitch, uh, Suzuki again, um, Geico, which I ended up taking. Um, and, you know, the Geico team was great. The bike was great. I just, I, it didn't happen for me, honestly. I mean, there's no real reason why I shouldn't have been or, or couldn't have been a lot more successful than I was. You know, there were people around me um, winning championships. Eli uh, Vogel won a championship. Will won a championship all in, you know, the two years that I was there. So it was all, it was all there to, to do well with, obviously. But um, I just didn't make it happen. And then uh, the, the Husky, you know, revitalization of the brand thing came along. And um, that was, again, back to Rockstar Suzuki. You know, they had, they had given me a couple shots before and I had passed, which I, you know, I felt like this was the one. Um, and at the time, like, I was not being that successful as a motocross and supercross guy. And I had done some off-road stuff and, and I kind of saw the Husky thing as almost like two plans, you know, like if I go there for two years, it doesn't go well, then I can just kind of step right into off-road and, you know, it'll be totally fine. So I took, I took the deal. It was a really good deal. It was better than the deal I was on at Geico. And um, I took the deal knowing the bike was going to be, you know, relatively good right off the bat. And um, we had, 15 was decent. I got on the podium a couple of times. Um, I had an injury at the first round of Supercross, but I rode through it the whole time. So it was kind of tough, but outdoors was decent. I got on the podium a couple of times there. And then in 16, I was really close to some wins, like really, really close to winning races. And um, finally won one at Red Bud or at Bud's Creek at the end of the year. And, and that kind of started, you know, the path that I'm on now. Well, well we're just past the halfway point. 15 minutes can save you a lot more than 15%. If you go to Rocky Mountain, ATVMC.com, Slick Products, go to their homepage, ODIGrips.com, and of course, FoxRacing.com. The United States Motorcycle Coaching Association connects riders with the best certified coaches to elevate their riding experience and improve their skills. A safe learning environment is the first step to good coaching, and all USMCA certified coaches uphold the values and code of conduct of the USMCA. Our coaches have cleared a national level background check and are CPR and first aid certified. Log on to MotorcycleCoaching.org, type in your zip code to find the coach nearest you. All right, so you signed uh, uh, Bobby Hewitt's running team. Uh, this is when you hooked up with Dave Feeney, right? Yep. So Dave was my original mechanic at Rockstar Husqvarna in 2015. Um, and he's been the guy since. I mean, he's been around a long time and it just seems like, I mean, I'm not super close with you guys, whatever, but it seems like you guys have an incredible bond. Um, Ricky had, had a few mechanics that he was really tight with. I did also. What's that, uh, what's that relationship been like for you? It's been awesome. Dave has more stories than you have time to hear. I mean, he's been, around for a long time and and worked with some great riders and he's been awesome for me you know I think that he's just he's a little bit like Brittany and and we're we're all a little bit you know obviously Dave is older but we're older souls and and it just kind of works because we're all you know we're not there for fame or or you know likes or whatever we're just there to go racing and, and have a good time and um Dave's into that. I think that's his thing. You know, like this weekend, he's going to that Calvi MX at Glen Helen, I believe it is. Like, he goes to Day in the Dirt every year. Every, a lot of the weekends that we're not racing, he's he's racing himself. So, um, he's he's such a good guy, such a good mechanic, and he's just so easy to work with. Hey, Ricky, you retired at age 26, right? 27, yeah. 27, sorry. Zach, you're not only the oldest first time 450 motocross champion but you're the oldest pro motocross champion ever that's 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 an interesting uh statistic for you yeah it is you know i i've seen a lot of questions and answers and stuff online um as to why people retire young but i think 
the biggest thing for me is, you know, I've only had like championship type pressure for four years now since 2017. And, and, you know, Ricky dealt with that stuff for 10 years from, from the day he turned pro basically. So, and, and that's what, in my opinion, really wears you out, you know, like training wise, I feel great. Um, my body feels great. I'm not in any way tired. Actually, my fitness, it comes to me easier now than it ever has because I, you know, I have a lot of base and, and 30, 29 to 34 is like prime age for cardio type stuff. So to me, what, why guys retire or, you know, maybe Ricky can speak to this, but the reason would be just the mental pressure. It's hard. You know, this, this last 10 weeks for me has been tough. You want everything to go right. It, it would be so simple if we just went racing on Saturdays, but there's a lot of hours and a lot of things that have to happen for it to go right on Saturday. Um, and, and that's a completely different set of pressures, you know? So, uh, I think that the, the biggest difference for me and the reason that I'm still going at kind of the rate I'm going is because the success has come a little later for me and, and I'm at a different place where I can just kind of embrace it all and enjoy it. And, you know, I look back to being 25 or 26 and the, the mental maturity that I have now compared to then, I'm not sure that I could have handled the situations that I'm in now. Um, then, you know, just from, from a racing perspective. So, yeah. I mean, you're definitely firing. I mean, you're at the pinnacle and the, and the peak of your career at the age of 30. So yeah, completely different. However, you're right. I mean, Jeff, you know, you know, as well, just the pressures that come mentally from, you know, trying to win championships and then, you know, trying to uh, keep that championship. That's, that's another pressure in itself. And uh, it, it definitely. However, Ricky, like, what, what was the, what? think about what he just said. So this, this, the statistics say that 29 to 34 is when your body's in peak position. So when I retired, I still had four more years of peak athletic, you know, physical, prowess that I was going to throw on you but oh (laughs) it's funny you say that Zach because uh my final season uh when I was prepping and doing my off-season training I just like remember how good I felt every single day on the track and I was like okay is it because I have so many years you know in the tank or is it because I don't have the pressure of trying to compete for a championship? And I could never really identify that. I did like the fact that I was going to the races and didn't have the pressure of having to win a championship. Uh, but I also felt it like on my bike. And, and like you're saying, you know, you, you're older now. You have so much of a base that the training part is, is the easy part. And I feel like, do you feel like you appreciate it more? And, and it's fun. It's not as much of a drag. Yeah, well, that's kind of what I was saying with the mental maturity. It's not really like a, like a, a tangible thing, you know, but it, it's just a, an appreciation and uh, a gratitude for the situation and, and, you know, kind of everything that, that you get to do and, and not have to do. I think that that's a big thing. You know, you see when you're younger, you see things as, as, um, as a more of a job, honestly, you know, and, and then when you, you get a little older, you see, you know, other people that aren't quite as fortunate as you or, or, you know, that have to grind a lot harder and gone from home a lot more. And, and you start to appreciate, you know, how, how good you actually have it. I think that that's a, a big part of it. Um, I, I honestly, I enjoy riding still. I mean, I, I have fun on the bike and there's days, you know, I'm a little weird, but, the, the the hard days in the summer heat in Florida are where, where I enjoy it, you know? Um, and I think that that's kind of one, one place where I'm lucky is I, I like to suffer. I, I don't mind it. I think it's a, a huge part of who I am and that, that helps me on the weekends too. Let's uh, let's talk about this pro motocross championship. We've got about seven minutes or so left before we hit the 30 minute mark. Um, started out with a win, right? And, um, it was, uh, you, you, you won the second moto at the opening round. And then as, as we're all watching qualifying and all this on the, uh, on NBC sports, um, you had that moment where there was an issue with the bike and it was looking like that you might not even qualify for a second. What was, 
you know, so you, you had this super, you know, you started out like, wow, this is great. I had this win. And then this moment of, of uh, real urgency there. Yeah. Um, it was tough, you know, to be in that position. I worked pretty hard in that first race to, to make it happen. And I knew, I, I honestly didn't believe in my heart of hearts that we were going to get nine races or that we were going to go to all the places we were supposed to just with the way things were going, getting closer to, you know, date, dates and deadlines. And, and I, I just didn't think we would get that many races. So my goal was from day one was to kind of stack as many points as I could. And then, yeah, I, I got it done at the first race. And then we had the issue at the second race and, and it was kind of hard to swallow. Like I, you know, we were missing the A practice at there at the, at the end of the A practice and then the B practice started and we still weren't quite ready to go. And I was nervous, honestly. It was, it was one of the hard, it was the hardest moment of this year for sure. Um, one of the harder moments of my career, you know, as far as something was that was out of my control um, that, I, that I had no way to fix or, you know, nothing I could do uh, was going to fix the problem. And it, it was tough, you know, and to be able to kind of bounce back that day and still get a win was, was big for me mentally, I think. Zach, I mean, I, 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 I want to know, like, up until the last six months, basically till we got to Salt Lake City, I want to know two things. What were your expectations going from 250 to 450? Like, what did you think you were going to do? Did you think you were going to pick up where you left off in 250 into 450 and how hard was it mentally that first basically year and a half on your 450 career? Well, I, I mean, obviously it's a huge transition. Um, I was coming off an injury when I started my 450 career. So I knew things were going to be tough, but my, my 450, my first 450 boot camp was the best riding of my, of my life, hands down. Like it was, it was easy. I found a setting instantly that I was comfortable with and I was riding the best I've ever ridden in my life. So I felt like it was, it was going to go good. And then I had one tiny mistake on a wheel tap that cost me massively, um, really jacked up my collarbone and, and kind of shut things down. And then, um, you know, last outdoor season was really good for me as well. I, I, I had 22 or 21 of 22 motos in the top five. I missed one round at Red Bud um, due to another little injury. And, you know, that's when I kind of started to realize that I, I could kind of do it. Um, and then this, this year uh, during Supercross, the first round, I was really sick um, for, for 10 days. I ran a fever and just was, was zapped and, and it took it out of me for like, six weeks and and I wasn't riding as much as I should have could have you know needed to be um not because I didn't want to or I was being lazy but because I was just not well enough to really handle the workload and still go racing on the weekends um and then I finally started to find a little bit of form in Dallas and, and crashed the next week broke my back and my wrist and um jacked my lungs up pretty good and and that was that was a big moment for me. You know, I, I kind of questioned whether I could continue. Um, and then when I started riding again, it was going good until two weeks before, before Salt Lake, I just started to struggle. Um, uh, my body wasn't really responding again. And I was just kind of like lethargic feeling and, and my riding just was not there. And, and, um, Brittany and I actually, we seriously talked about, like, look, we'll just miss Salt, the Salt Lake deal. It's not like we're in the Supercross Championship or anything of the sort. And we can get ready, stay here, take some more time, get ready for outdoors, um, and it'll be good. And I was like, no, like, honestly, the, the indecision was, like, I need to change the scenery. We'll go there. I'll, you know, I'll race, and it'll be fine. You know, no one really expects anything because – I've been pretty jacked up and, and the things, you know, the riding and stuff hasn't been going that great. So let's just go, you know, we'll take the motor home, we'll camp at a campground and, and just kind of have fun with it. And, and that's what we did. And um, I was able to get some good results there in the beginning and, and build a little confidence and, and win one there at the end. And that was um, again, a big turning point where I realized like, you know what, I, I can do it. And um, the, the, the bummer part was it was seven weeks until outdoors after that. So I needed to, you know, kind of hold on to that feeling in that moment for seven weeks and able, in order to be able to carry that into the outdoors. And 
I didn't really know if that was even possible because it's such a long time, you know, normally we have one weekend and we're, we're going racing, which would have benefited me in this particular situation. But um, again, I was able to, to go to the outdoors and, and just kind of pick up where I left off. And that was kind of set the bar for the summer for me. So there, there were two moments uh, towards the end of the pro motocross championship here that kind of stand out to me. Um, and I wonder if they, I, I assume that they link together, but so you had the bad second moto at Millville at Spring Creek. You, you went 416 there, but then you backed it up with um, wins at WW Ranch. And so it's like this low point, and then the, you, you know, you instantly responded to that. So talk about those two weekends as they link uh, together. Yeah, Millville, I, I hated the track, honestly. Um, it Millville? was just not typical Millville, and yeah. it was kind of flat and hard and that's just not my forte, um, honestly. Uh, so I just wasn't that good. First moto, I was fourth, but just kind of a mediocre fourth. And then I was running fourth in the second moto when I got the flat. And, um, you know, I looking back now, I should have stopped. I, I did not see my team. I don't know how uh, I didn't see them, um, but I didn't. And uh, that that maybe cost me some points in the, in the scheme. But WW, I knew, you know, with Adam – making huge gains in his riding and it starts being good. Like I needed to strike back big and, and make it happen. And um, I love WW. It's set up perfect for me basically because it was hot, um, rough, and that's when I excel. And I was able to go there and get a one, one and, and kind of swing things back my way. Um, I knew that would be crucial going into the last two because I, I just felt like, you know, if I could kind of get another stranglehold on it again, it, there's no way that they could, could, you know, come back without some astronomical major catastrophe. So um, that was, that was my plan. And I mean, yeah, it worked out probably better than I could have planned it, but um, it, yeah, that was, that was the, the biggest moment of the season. I think. The second moto when you didn't need to win the moto to win the overall, correct? And watching that moto and Tomac had one of these motos where all of a sudden he decides he's going to, he's going to be on fire and you've seen him coming through the pack. And when, and when you, it's like you said, no, not today. I want to be the champ. And Ricky, you always say, you want to be the champ. You got to beat the champ. Granted, you weren't, he wasn't necessarily points racing you at that point, but the, it was really symbolic that you you didn't need to win it, but you you know you put your foot down and said, "No, I'm going to win this one too." Yeah, I think it was maybe a little bit of you know me just wanting to win flat out, um, and, and I knew he, you know he was like maybe six seconds back with like four or five laps to go, and I started to see him. Um, he at WW, there's a couple of turns that are 180s, and you can see perfectly. And once he got by, um, I think it was uh, Marv, I was like, mm, this could this could get dicey here at the end. So I kind of laid up a little bit and and not waited on him. But, you know, I, I knew the last two laps were going to be heavy because it was hot as crap and it was rough. And um, I just knew that I needed to have a little bit of reserve if I wanted to fight with him. There was there was no way I was just going to flat out beat him on speed. So I kind of tried to beat him on, you know, not fitness, but, but I knew he had to be a little tired than I was coming from like 10th or wherever he was coming from passing guys. He had to be out of Taros because that place is so hard on goggles. Every little turn that you go through, you get smoked and then you have to pull hair off. So I was out of Taros in the first moto. So um, when he got to me, I tried to just like literally roost the crap out of him over all those rollers and, and <laughs> fill him in and, and it worked out for me. But, but Zach, I mean, those kind of rides and Jeff, you and I have talked about it off there. I mean, that's what I admire your riding uh, and, and just your mentality and your focus and the mental fortitude that you have. That's what I really admire about you is you very rarely do you ever lay up unless something's wrong. And I, I just feel, I, I loved to see that, you know, you're like, screw this, man, I'm not rolling over and I'm going to go out here doing something you have to do or doing something that you don't have to do. And that's, it's just so comforting and, and fun to watch. Thank and, you. 
like I said, the mental fortitude that you've, you've shown, especially uh, being able to come back and put yourself on top uh, on the 450, the premier class of, of motorcycle racing, dirt bike racing, uh, coming from where you came from is, is tough to do. So uh, congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I kind of, you know, if, if I have it in me, I'm going to go for it, honestly. Um, if there's not something wrong with me or, or my motorcycle, I'm going to give it everything I have. And, and that was kind of one of those days where, like Jeff said, I didn't really need to win it to win the overall, but it was a little bit of like, Hey, I, you know, I can win. So why would not? Um, and, and I didn't feel like I was taking any risk to, to do so. So you might as well go for it. Okay. So here we are. We get to the final round at Fox Raceway in Pala, California. Um, You've got a decent amount of points. Uh, Cincerillo's riding well. That's who your points racing for the championship. Um, but you talked earlier, earlier about expectations and pressure and things like that. Um, your your moto results that day were a five seven. And, yeah. And so for if if somebody was listening to this and they go, wait a second, how how, how could Zach go out and win both motos at WW Ranch? but then come to Fox Raceway and go 5-7. So explain what, what, you know, Ricky and I obviously have been through it, but like in your own words, try to help the listeners understand what that pressure and expectations, whether it's on yourself, whether it's external, whether it's business, you know, everything involved when you come down to the final uh, championship weekend like that. I don't know if it's, really explainable to, to someone who's never experienced, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I've felt a lot of pressure. Uh, Vegas 2017 was, was immense pressure, but, and I, you know, I had way more gap this time, obviously, uh, going into this than I did that. And, and it was still just way more pressure to be able to write your name in, in the books in the 450 class in either Supercross or Motocross is a massive deal. Um, comes with a lot of of good things to your life um and i i felt an, an insane amount of pressure um obviously we we had had a couple little hiccups with the bike so you know i'm trying to preserve every single thing um every noise you hear is like magnified times 50 um everything you feel you know the bike's falling apart or you know what whatever it, it's just it's it's a hard hard situation to really go out there it's hard to enjoy it during the day for sure. But after it's over, it, it's such a, you know, such a relief and such like elation that um, you just want to sleep for like a week. The, uh, and the, the track there, uh, I actually just wrote it a couple of days ago. It's not an easy track in a lot of ways, you know, it's very sort of unsettling. Did you, did you feel that also? Yeah, I, I have, I haven't been to or tested in California outdoors since before Hangtown in 2019 so um, I knew I was going to have some some hurdles as far as my setup went and um, getting some some good comfort with the track and I was able to do that you know I, my fifth in the first moto was decent until the end um, and then the second moto I kind of just cruised it on in you know I saw Ferrandis and in, in his motos kind of taking some risks and almost having you know throwing it away and the track is um, it gets these little like sneaky square grooves in it that you can't really see and, and they will bite you so quick and also it's quite rocky so I was trying to you know avoid rocks and there's just so many things that are going through your head and and trying to just take care of every single one of them is stressful. It was great to see you with uh, with the family with your team which I assume is like family at this point um, and wrap up um, you know a championship like this um, what was that feeling or when was that moment that you uh, maybe you went back to the RV, maybe it's when you got home that you just had, you got a chance to sit down and, and think, holy shit, I just won the 450 Pro Motocross title. Um, probably the next morning um, when I woke up and I asked Brittany, I was like, is it real? You know, like, <laughs> is this for real? And she was like, yeah, it is real. And uh, that was, that was probably the moment when it, it really was like, man, that's, that's freaking cool, you know? And then um, also the next day, when I, whenever Mathis introduced me on Pulp, he, you know, he said the 2020 motocross champion. And I was just like, man, 
it's pretty, it's pretty unreal. You know, I, I never, ever saw myself. There's been plenty of times in my career where I never saw myself making it to, to the 450 class, let alone, you know, on a factory team and then winning and then winning the championship as well. It's just um, way more than I ever dreamed of, to be honest. Well, well, Ricky, there's so much more that we could throw into this 30 plus two, um, but our time is up and Zach, we appreciate you coming on. You got any final words, Ricky? I just, you know, I said it earlier, your mental fortitude and what you've shown. I love your never say die attitude. Keep it up, man. I mean, you're there and the, uh, you know, you can do it as long as you want to. You're still relatively young. You're still in your peak and uh, it's a lot of fun to watch and just, just keep up the good work, man. You know what you're doing and uh, I can't wait to watch you. Uh, 2021 Supercross, I think you're going to pick up where you like left off. You've got great confidence coming from a, what I thought was a great showing at Salt Lake City. Didn't even know you had those issues So leading into that. So um, just fantastic job and keep doing what you're doing, man. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me on and thank you for your kind words. I, I greatly appreciate it from the two, you know, icons of the sport. It means a lot. Well, thanks for uh, taking the time away from Brittany, Brittany Emery, and Bodie. Uh, enjoy the rest of your vacation. We can't wait to uh, see you back again for Supercross here uh, in uh, less than a couple months. So uh, thanks for being on. Also, thanks to uh, RockyMountainATVMC.com, Slick Products, ODI Grips, and Fox Racing. So that's the show. We appreciate everybody uh, listening or watching. Uh, and so uh, we're going to take you away, as we always do, with the Andrew McKeague Band and this old lie. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys.